Hi, good morning. It's a, it's a real treat to be able to talk to you about some of the innovations that we've been experiencing within cognitive neuroscience over the past decade. And to start this out, I want to uh, take you through the experience of what it would be to come into our lab and to participate in the kinds of experiments that we run. And what we would do is, well, we would slide you ever so gently into our MRI scanner. We'd ask you to relax and hold as still as you possibly could. And do nothing more than keep your eyes on that crosshair. And, and it's strange that this uh, cross that's up on the, the screen would constitute one of the major innovations within cognitive neuroscience over the past decade, but in fact it does. And that's because for years people thought that as you are looking at this crosshair, the mind is in a neutral state. It's doing nothing. It's a baseline condition. It's putting your car into neutral. And so what we can do is we can start to understand brain function by contrasting it with the state when you're looking at this crosshair. So if we take a moment to look at it, well, you might be thinking many things, such as what am I going to say next? You might be thinking about what you're going to have for lunch. You might be thinking about something you just heard. But the mind is anything but in a baseline condition. The mind is anything but silent. And so, over the past few years, it's become an ongoing challenge to try and understand what is the brain activity that's giving rise to these thoughts that we have within our own minds uh, when we're allowed to uh, mind wander, when we're allowed to uh, think about whatever might come into our heads. And one of the remarkable findings has been not only are there certain brain areas that are actually more active when you're allowed to let your mind wander, but that there are ongoing activity in the brain that are organized, they're coherent, uh, they're consistent across individuals, even though our own experiences of looking at simple, uh, something as simple as a crosshair um, seem so unique. And so to give you an example of the brain activity that's present ubiquitously, it's present all the time uh, in, uh, in each of us, whether we're resting, whether we're uh, competing in some sort of an athletic competition, whether we're solving a cognitive puzzle. These fluctuations that you're about to see are taking place all the time. And this is an example of them. In red, you see activity in the brain that's higher. In blue, you see lower activity. In green, is somewhere in the middle. And these are real time. This is as it would be acquired on the scanner in a single individual. These kinds of fluctuations are taking place in our brain whatever we're doing. And though they might be modulated slightly by input from the environment, these are quite prominent features of what constitutes our basic brain activity. These are the waves that we're riding upon. Now, on the one hand, we can use this brain activity to try and understand how different parts of the brain are talking to each other, how they're communicating. Because if two areas are uh, synchronized, if they're fluctuating in some coordinated fashion, we can assume that they're communicating with each other. We can map out connections between them. And to give you an example of how we do that, we would draw a line between every pair of areas in the brain that are synchronized. And that graph might look something like this. Now, this has become a field of study that's known as the human connectome, or trying to understand the set of all the connections in the human brain, in the same way that one might try to understand the genome by looking at all the genes. We can then bundle these together, tie them together, and begin to study the way that different networks organize, different functional systems are coordinated. It's by looking at the activity level in these different functional systems that we can try to understand how slow activity in the brain then relates to modulating our behavior and our relationship with the environment. Um, this is just another example of how we can try and delineate anatomical networks, anatomical connections. But what I'd like to focus on more specifically for the rest of the talk are a couple of networks that have become quite prominent uh, in, the, in the field of, of cognitive neuroscience for understanding the relationship between these slow dynamics, these slow changes in brain network activity and how we relate to the world around us and how we relate to our own internal states. The one in yellow and orange that you see up here has been affectionately termed the default mode network. And it's been termed the default mode network because it was actually found to be more active when people were in this baseline resting condition than when they were given a task to do. So if I ask you to add two numbers together, there are certain areas of the brain that are involved in that specific function. But then if I contrast that with simply saying, take a look at that crosshair up on the screen, you'll begin thinking of all sorts of other things, usually things that are related to yourself, to your own physical state as you're sitting in the chair, to things that you did yesterday, to the things you might do tomorrow. And it's those self-related 
topics, those self-related functions that involve these areas of the brain that have become termed the default mode network. Early on in the field, which really only goes back about nine years at this point, it was found that if you look at the activity of the default mode network over time, you see it in the orange and the yellow lines up on the screen there, it's negatively correlated with another set of brain regions. Now, these have been termed the task-positive network. So there are areas of the brain that are implicated in observing what's taking place in the external environment, being ex-perspective, in being aware of the surroundings, being aware that things to, need to happen, reactions that may need to be made. And then there's a set of brain regions that are more introspective. They're looking at your current state within that environment, your current uh, mental, let's say, are you happy? How are you feeling? Uh, what would you like to do? What are you planning in the next few minutes, hours, or days? And that these two are in a constant state of anti-correlation. So there's a seesawing effect that's taking place. We're aware of what's happening in the environment. We're aware of what's happening ourselves. As I'm speaking here, you might find yourself thinking about something else. I, it, it, might, it might happen. Uh, and, and at that moment, your eyes might glaze over, and, and one might think, well, I've, well, from this perspective at least, well, I've lost you. And this is one of those reassuring moments where I can think back to the neuroscience of what's underlying these kinds of fluctuations and think, you'll be back. <laughs> um, so we're in this constant state of fluctuation, oscillating between these states. First point is the brain is always active. There is no resting condition for the brain. These spontaneous fluctuations that are taking place are always there, and the environment in this case is simply modulating them um, slightly compared to what they're doing on their own. And that these are very slow, at least the ones that we're looking at with MRI. These are on the order of 30 seconds to 100 seconds. And so for the first time within cognitive neuroscience at least, we have something that's related to brain function on a temporal scale um, that we're able to relate to phenomenologically. When we're talking about changes that are of 30 seconds, that's something that we can know. That's how we actually see and perceive ourselves within an environment. And unlike the kind of sub-second oscillations of neurons, um, these fluctuations, these changes in systems, and these dynamics are able to relate to the way that we relate to the world. Um, but how do these actually impact on how we're interacting with the environment? And where's the evidence of that? And I'll just give one example, although there are many. Um, this is from a cognitive study by Daniel Weissman. It's using something called a global local task. So you're looking at some S's, you're looking at some H's, they make up bigger S's, bigger H's, and you're asked to report on whether the bigger ones are S's or H's. What's important about this is that you're asked to do it for a long time and you're asked to respond as quickly as possible. So essentially what it's measuring is your reaction time on an attention task. And by looking at how quickly you respond and how that varies over time, you can then get a measure of general attention and how it's fluctuating. And what was found when looking at the brain data associated with performance on this task is that there are certain regions, the same ones we saw before, parts of the default mode network, even when the default mode network didn't have a name, uh, that decrease in activity in relationship to how quickly you respond to the environment. So performing well on this task is not simply a matter of having the right brain areas activated. It's having another set of brain regions deactivated. They have to decrease in activity to give room for the attention to be focused on this externally oriented task. And then on the other side of that, you have a set of brain regions that are actually implicated in the task. What's interesting here is that seconds before you actually respond, the activity level in these regions could predict your performance in the task. So you're establishing a certain state, again, like riding along these waves, and then when the task moment arrives, it's the state that you're in that to a certain degree is going to predict your performance. And that state is dependent not only on having the right set of tools to be able to uh, perform the task at hand, but deactivating those that might interfere. So to try and give a summary in, a, in, a, in an image here, this default mode network idea, the orange and yellow regions being decreased in response to the environment, and those in blue that would be implicated in the task or the externally oriented task increasing at the right time. So these slow fluctuations, these waves that we're riding upon, uh, impact on how we respond 
to the environment. But importantly, I think attention is something that we consider to be entirely um, oriented towards externally related goals. And this helps us to rethink and reformulate how we talk about attention because focusing can be something highly internal as well. And so it's more a question of where attention is directed. Is it internally or is it externally? And there are systems that are involved in modulating where that attention is going to be directed. But it's a balancing between those two. Unfortunately, the, the, the system, it's just like, I wish it were that simple. I do. Uh, because it would, you know, we could move on to other, other jobs and questions and things at that point. But unfortunately, the story gets more complicated, and that does actually help keep us uh, you know, with work. Um, so the, these two systems do interact in a more complex way, and that's been one of the exciting findings. They're not actually anti core It's not a seesaw, and I think we know that from our own experience. It's not as simple as thinking about something internally one moment, and then you're completely focused on the outside world the next. And there are ways that we can measure that, and this is something called a sliding window approach, where you look at how correlated these two networks are over time, and you shift from one time point to the next, and look at the level of correlation, and look at how it's changing. So there might be moments in time where the two are highly correlated, there could be others a couple minutes later where they're not. And we can then try and relate that to asking questions about the content of our mental experience. This is an ongoing line of research, but one of the challenges now of trying to understand mental experience is how do we even categorize it? Well, when you're, you're getting started in a field like this, the best way to start understanding the content of mental experience is to ask people what they're thinking about. And so we ask people what they're thinking about right when they come out of the scanner. We try to cluster that into various categories that we can use to understand how variation in the content of spontaneous thought relate to the dynamics of these networks that are present. In this case, one of the uh, findings that we're quite excited about, and as I mentioned, this is an ongoing line of research, but if you look at the uh, positive thought content, so how much people rated their own thoughts when they were in the scanner, as being related to positively valenced content. It was negatively correlated, so meaning that the higher the positive thought content, the less switching, the less dynamicism you had across these networks, the more stable the network configurations were. So, of course, there's an enormous amount to try and understand now about why it is that something as simple as this one-dimensional construct of positive thought relates to the complexity of brain dynamics, but it begins to give us the tools to ask questions about how these interactions and how these slow fluctuations and, changing, and changes in dynamics relate to the content of our mental experience internally. Which really gets down to this sort of joke we stole from Seneca, uh, rest is far from restful. Um, these dynamics are ubiquitous, as I mentioned. We're riding along uh, these waves of brain activity. And I think it's an exciting moment because we're able to finally ask questions now about this black box, um, about the crosshair that's up on the screen that for a decade within cognitive neuroscience, one was not allowed access to. We're able to open up questions about what is happening internally to us. How is our own experience being modulated? How does it relate to brain activity? And what is really the, um, the contents of thought that are important to us, um, that are unavoidable, um, and that we need to account for if we're thinking about what it is to relate to the person that's sitting in front of us and, and what we are and aren't in full control of about modulating our own experience of the world. So yeah, just to sum up, the brain is never off though we sometimes might wish it were, uh, it is always active. And it's the external factors that really modulate rather than determine how the system operates. And that we have a fluctuation that's taking place constantly, of course, with varying degrees of um, complexity within that, but predominantly between these two main systems of internally and externally oriented attention. And finally, we need to account for how it is on these 30 seconds, 30 to 100 second fluctuations. If that's a temporal domain that's important for how we relate to the environment, how can we be accounting for that more in the way that we think about human dynamics? And, and that's one of the challenges that I think this line of research does pose for all of us. So thank you so much for your attention. And <laughs>